Hi, I would like to thank you, the organizers, for this invitation. And today I will talk about investigating interlift coupling of asymmetric lipid bilayers. Okay, so here is our problem. The plasma membrane, uh, or the cell membrane, is a, a physical barrier that separates the external and the internal environment of the cell. It's composed of hundreds of lipids. And the lipid composition of the inner leaflet and the outer leaflet is completely different. Um, so the exoplasmic leaflet is enriched with sphingomyelin, a ordered lipid, phosphatidylcholine, and cholesterol. And simplified model membranes with such lipid composition may form coexistence of liquid phase. Here, liquid disordered and liquid ordered phase. On the other hand, the, the cytoplasmic leaflet is enriched with different lipids, and that is uh, phosphatidylethanolamine, PS, and cholesterol. And these lipids are very disordered. They are polyunsaturated lipids. And uh, on average, the number of unsaturation per lipid in the cytoplasmic leaflet is twofold greater than the exoplasmic leaflet. So this leaflet is very fluid. And as pointed out by experiments in model membrane, uh, this composition must form a fluid phase. So uh, the plasma membrane asymmetry is very important for the cell function. Cells spend a lot of energy to maintain this uh, membrane asymmetric. Uh, certainly, cells evolve to search high complexity for a reason. In addition, unhealthy cells or cells signally to death could lose their asymmetry. Okay, to study the bilayer asymmetry, we first need a method to create asymmetric membranes. And I developed a method to prepare these asymmetric bilayers in vitro. Uh, this method uses the concept of the hemifusion, and it was published in 2019 and invited to be the journal cover of Biophysical Journal. It's important to know that the hemifusion is when the two outer leaflets of two initially independent bilayers are connected and they can exchange lipids by diffusion. Okay, in our model of the plasma membrane, we will engineer an asymmetric bilayer that one leaflet phase separates into LD and a low phase, and another leaflet is a fluid phase. So for a percentage of lipid exchange greater than 75%, these leaflets should form a fluid phase. Uh, here, these dyes labels the outer leaflet and the inner leaflet, and both dyes prefer the LD phase. So this domain here is a LD domain, and the dark domain here is a LO phase. So a surprising result that is that when the composition of the outer leaflet should form a fluid phase, we are still observing domains. So this dye labels only the outer leaflet. So the phase separation of these leaflets in those domain on these leaflets expect to be uniform. So creating a more ordered domain. We also observe that asymmetric domains are different from the symmetric LD and the LO phase. And here we show the partition coefficient of the these fluorescent probes. And they show different uh, properties, né? different partition coefficient in symmetric and asymmetric bilayers. So these induced ordered domains, uh, we observe that in different lipid mixtures, and different lipid composition, and especially in this composition here, uh, this system is poor in cholesterol. So the ordered phase is a gel phase, and we are observing these induced ordered domains. Interestingly, the induced ordered domains, they were observed before, uh, first by TENS groups in 2009, using supported lipid bilayers, also asymmetric bilayers, and then in 2015 by London's groups, and they use a different procedure to make these asymmetric bilayers. Okay, so then we can think about the principles of induced uh, order domains. When we have an asymmetric bilayer, a high energy penalty may occur in the bilayer midplane when, the, when two different phases are opposed to each other. To decrease this high surface tension of mismatching phases opposed to each other, this domain could become more ordered and vice versa. Thus, this uh, phase separated leaflet can induce domains on a leaflet expect to be uniform. Then we can ask what's happened if the both leaflets uh, have cholesterol, 
We know that cholesterol has a high affinity for this high melting lipid. We also know that cholesterol has a poor head group. Uh, and cholesterol prefers interacts with this high melting lipid. This or the domain, the low phase, is enriched with uh, high melting lipid and cholesterol. And this highly ordered environment protects cholesterol from soft exposure. So in, a, in the absence of a high melting lipid, cholesterol may not induce such high order, but actually it does not need to, because the order was induced by the upper leaflet, and uh, since the uh, environment uh, more ordered was created, it's reasonable to suggest that cholesterol prefers that induced order domains, because, because it can pack better with the somehow organized acyl chains, and also, uh, that lipid may protect cholesterol from soft exposure. Okay. So then, uh, this is uh, one of our finds that was published at uh, JAX, invited to be the journal cover. So then, we can ask what's happened if we replace this lipid here, DSPC, by a shorter lipid, DPPC. Right. So then, we, we did a similar experiment. And when we perform a similar experiment, but using DPPC instead of DSPC, we observe that when the outer leaflet, when this leaflet should form a fluid phase, the entire bilayer appears uniform. Again, this uh, green uh, label here labels the outer leaflet only. But we observe a chain. Uh, there is no domains. So if the bilayer becomes a single phase, that could be explained by interleaflet coupling. So we look at the existing theory. And, and uh, phase diagrams for asymmetric bilayer were constructed using mean field theory. So here we have a binary mixture that can be used for LD and a low phase, but we need to be careful to interpret these results. Um, so here is the free energy, and in the free energy we have a uh, uh, mixing, uh, uh, ideal uh, mixing term and a, uh, uh, a no ideal term. Here, this chi represents the interaction between first neighbors. And that, the, when we have an asymmetric bilayer, we have the free energy from one leaflet, from the second leaflet, and we have an additional term that is the coupling between the two leaflets. And this coupling term penalizes when different phases are opposed to each other, if I have an ordered phase opposed to a disordered phase. OK, so what these uh, authors found is that when they change this parameter coupling, the appearance of these phase diagrams also changes. OK, so as shown in the plots, as, as increase, uh, increase this capital lambda, the two phase region gets smaller. OK, so how to read this phase diagram? So in this X here, I will show the composition of the inner leaflet. And in the experiments that I will perform, I use a binary mixture of this DPPC and DOPC. So then I can represent this X as the fraction of DPPC. And in this X, I have the fraction of DPPC on the on the inner leaflet, sorry. Uh, here is the outer leaflet, is here in the, in the inner leaflet. Right. So then, um, for this point here, for example, 0 0.5 and 0 0.5, uh, we have exactly the same fraction of DPPC in the inner in the outer leaflet. So that means a symmetric bilayer. So any point on this diagonal line, we have a symmetric bilayer. And any point that is not on this diagonal line, we have an asymmetric bilayer. Right. So then we can use our method of hemifusion to build this phase diagram experimentally. OK. So let's think uh, a little bit uh, about this phase diagram and how our experiment work. So let's look at the composition here, the square and the triangle. I start with a symmetric bilayer, the composition is square. I replace the outer leaflet with a fluid lipid, uh, meaning that we are decreasing the fraction of DPPC and increasing the fraction of DOPC. Then for a certain percentage of lipid exchange, uh, we have the composition here in this triangle. 
the inner leaflet did not change. So the composition of the inner leaflet is GZ square. And uh, for this percentage of lipid exchange, this uh, leaflet is expected to form a fluid phase. So any points below this line, this dashed line here, is expected to, to form a fluid phase. So I represented these two points in this cartoon here. So one leaflet is phase separated, and another leaflet is uniform. It should form a fluid phase. So then let's think about that we have a very low energy penalty. And in my example, I will be the ordered lipid, and I am here in this ordered domain. So then I look underneath me, and I see a fluid lipid. And then I say, oh, it's OK. You can be fluid. You can be ordered or disordered. I don't care. So the, co the, the energy penalty there, it's very low. OK. So then we will increase this energy penalty a little bit. And again, I am supposing that I am an ordered lipid, and I am opposed to a disordered lipid. But now, I don't like this disordered lipid much. And I say, no, you have to change. OK, so a redistribution of lipids happen. And these uh, ordered lipids start to concentrate underneath these ordered domains. OK, we have seen something similar, the cholesterol redistribution, the Jack's paper that I mentioned before. But then, Let's increase this energy penalty by a lot. Then let's suppose again that I am this ordered lipid, and underneath me I see a disordered, uh, disordered face. And I say, oh, now I hate you. You, you have to change. But the, the, this leaflet underneath me replies back and say, no, no, no. I also hate you, and you is the one that has to change. And the phase separation is abolish it. OK, in other words, the energy penalty to have different phases opposed to each other is so great that the phase separation is unsustainable. OK, so to be complete, I am almost finished. <laughs> uh, we, ha we actually have a competition of interactions. The line tension is an intralift interaction that drives phase separation. When we have a high line tension, uh, uh, that drives phase separation. And on the other hand, if we have a high energy penalty to have different phases opposed to each other, that vanishes the phase separation. OK, so then we built the first uh, phase diagram of asymmetric bilayer experimentally. And then we can investigate this parameter of interleafed coupling. Uh, that is not a parameter that we can easily measure on the, in the laboratory. And important here is that the plasma membrane is asymmetric. and it can control the composition of individual leaflets in a way that could control the appearance of domains or induced domains or vanish the domains if necessary. And then I would like to thank you all for your attention. I'd like to thank the organizers again, and I will be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Thais, for this impressive talk. So we have time for questions, please. So you talked about the equilibrium properties of these guys, right? Uh, how about phase separation kinetics? Does it take too long or? Kinetics. So like we, we, those are in equilibrium, right? So uh, we, we are not studying the kinetics of these domains. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your question. So Thais, what comes next now? I mean, what will you continue investigating? Um, uh, there are a few uh, models that I would like to pursue. One of them is when the, for, uh, the plasma membrane is asymmetric, but uh, when cells get sick, they, they lose that asymmetry in a way that, for example, the PS, the phosphoserine that is in the inner leaflet, is flipped to the outer leaflet. So I want to build a, a model for cancer cells but a mimetic model that we can uh, maybe use some drugs to test these uh, model membranes. Fantastic. More questions? Thank you. <laughs> if not, let's think. Oh, there, there, there is a question there. Yeah, please. At 
the very beginning, you said that if uh, you had uh, an increase in surface tension, that you had a more uh, tendency to order the system. Can you explain that again, please? Increase in the surface tension? The beginning? Oh, right. I think I. Um, OK. So here it's because ooh, if we have a very high energy penalty, because these two lipids, they are very different. One is very ordered, and the, another one is very disordered. So that creates a high uh, surface tension here. And so in a way to decrease this surface tension, this energetic cost, uh, this, uh, ordered, uh, this disordered lipids could become more ordered in a way that, that could be just ordering the, the acyl chains or a redistribution of lipids as we see the redistribution of cholesterol, for instance. Right. Okay. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you. Now I move to the next speaker, Marcio Sampaio Gomez Filho. Let's see if you can manage to put your presentation in. Okay, uh, Marcia will, will tell about modern day diffusion, erosion, crossover, dynamic and drug release. Marcio, please. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk about my work today. Modeling the diffusion, erosion, crossover dynamics in drug delivery. Uh, this work has been done in collaboration with Professor Marco Aurelio Alves and Professor Fernando Rivera, both from the University of Brasilia. So let's start with a brief motivation here. Uh, on the left side, I'm presenting an overview of drug delivery systems development from basic research to up to clinical applications. So the first step, as you can see, there are many steps, but the first step, we should identify a drug that can be potentially applied for some disease or for some therapeutic reasons. Uh, the next step is determining how to deliver this drug at desired release kinetics, for example, by this may depend on the type of material us to control the release, uh, for example, polymeric materials and the associated release mechanisms. And for the entire process, this can take many years up to the clinical applications. So on the right side, I am illustrating that uh, the use of mathematical modeling and computational modeling of the drug delivery, essentially how much of the drug is delivered of the time, can play a fundamental role in the development of new pharmaceutical devices, uh, maybe among of the benefits, Modeling allows us to gain physical insights into the release mechanism. So, uh, we are particularly interested in, in systems in which the drug deliveries are mainly determined by the polymer erosion in addition to the drug diffusion. One example of that is biodegradable polymers for cloud drug delivery systems. Essentially, what we have here is a, an implantable device on the eye. And as you can see here, the drug delivery is, take, uh, is controlled over a long period, essentially 20 days. And one advantage for that is essentially since the biopolymer has completely eroded uh, and its fragments absorbed by the body, surgical removal of the implant can be avoided. So uh, we want to study this uh, interplay between membrane erosion dynamics and drug diffusion. Uh, essentially, our purpose is to generalize our previous model to study these, essentially, these are Monte Carlo simulations of a lattice system. This is a representation of our capsule. Essentially, what we have is the blue particles are uh, covered by this membrane in red, and the particles are allowed to move randomly. And uh, when a particle goes to the pore, the yellow ones, it, it was removed from the systems. And what we account for is the number of particles that remains in the capsule. For example, in B, it's just a single realization. The y axis is on log logarithmic scale. This is a function of time. What we measure essentially is an average 
over different uh, simulations. And for the, this particular work, we, we have found scaling relations between the release parameters and the porosity. So now we perform Monte Carlo simulations for a two dimensional capsule, essentially the capsule with size L. Uh, it's the same idea, but instead of having a distribution of pores at the beginning of the simulation, now uh, the pores will be formed during the simulation, along the simulation. So we introduce the membrane erosion dynamics as simple as possible. Uh, we imagine that there is a probability P that a pore will be formed due to, for example, a possible interaction between the membrane particles and the environment particles. In, in this way, we imagine that our capsule is in an implicit fluid. So uh, we introduce a new random variable, x, uniformly distributed between 0 and 1. And if this number is less than probability that I'm assigning, uh, a pore will be formed randomly in a random place here. In this way, we have the erosion constant. It's an important feature that in this way, we obtain that the average number of membrane particles decay linear with time, and not is the uh, initial number of membrane particles. So just to illustrate uh, the idea, we have the results for a large capsule. On the left side, we have uh, the release fraction. On the right side, we have the membrane decay. Essentially, what we did, the blue points are the simulations for two different erosion constants. We fit for this y bone function, which is a common function us in the pharmaceutical literature. Uh, for the experimental research, there are also uh, uh, an experimental classification that relates the values of B with the drug release mechanism. And for example, in, in our work, as I will show, we quite corroborate this analysis. For example, we find that for B equal one, that's not there. We have a combined, essentially, interplay between both mechanisms in the sense that we have the interplay is a uh, crossover, what I call crossover. So uh, essentially, what we did is essentially investigate these release parameters, the fitting parameters as a function of different erosion constants and for different capsule size. There are some limit casings. For example, as we have a large kappa. Uh, we have that the membrane quickly disappears in the diffusions, the dominant mechanisms, or the eyes will have the erosion. And there is a particular value of kappa that should be our crossover value. We estimate this analytically. I will not do the math here, but when we have uh, the crossover, essentially we have an, an exponential decay. So uh, there are also other things that you can estimate, for example, by just doing dimensional analysis on the diffusion coefficient, it can expect that this characteristic release time, which is associated with more or less 60% of the drug has been re released, we can expect that this time increase with the square of the capsule, if you remember the dimension of the diffusion coefficient. As far as we have for the erosion constant, this is lean, and maybe it disappears, as I will show, uh, a crossover between this both uh, regimes essentially are the average between those. Uh, but we can prove this, or we can show this more rosy way by assuming that both mechanisms satisfy in a hands relation, we got this exponent uh, three halves. So uh, let's take a look at uh, just uh, simulation results. For example, here you have a logarithmic scale, both sides for the release parameter B as a function of the erosion constant. And as you can see here, there are two behaviors below and above 0 0.1 that we fit for different power laws. Essentially what we have is essential. Below this 0 0.1 we have like the erosion is dominant and uh, above the diffusion is dominant. And if you take a look at the, to the range of values, it's essentially the same as the, ex the experimental classification. So what we did next is if you uh, take this, the, the point in when these two equations are equal, we can estimate the crossover B and the crossover K kappa is essentially close to one, as I mentioned, and this is 0 0.1 for these numerical simulations. This became more uh, clear when we take a look for the characteristic release time as a function of the capsule side in log-log scale for a different erosion constant, and as you can see here, as we decrease the erosion constant, we pass from the quadratic behavior, for the crossover behavior, and for the linear behavior, in particular for 0 0.1, we have indeed our the three halves power law. So uh, the points are from the simulations, and what we propose essentially is a, a, a general form for, for a function that satisfies these extreme uh, regimes. Essentially, if you do not have the membrane, we should have a characteristic release time just depend on the diffusion, is our tau d. And uh, uh, we build this expression to satisfy this parallel dampness as far as we have 
kappa goes to infinity, we recover the quadratic behavior. Kappa goes to kc, kappa c, sorry. Uh, we have the three halves, and kappa goes to zero, we recover the linear behavior. And uh, what's very simple expression, uh, derived by assuming that there is an interplay between two mechanisms, and appears here the capsule size, the erosion constant, and the diffusion constant. What we do not know is essentially gamma, which is a model-dependent parameter, but what we'd like to know is essentially what is the crossover erosion constant that could give us an idea what are the mechanisms that are governing the drug release process. So we did this essentially for these uh, experimental results, is essentially a uh, release of acetomethyl paracetamol immersed in an erosive wax matrix. Essentially, they have a bunch of experimental data, and we choose a particular one that we find that was close to the crossover uh, erosion constant. Essentially, what I'm showing here is essentially our expression time, tau, in minutes as a function of gamma. Uh, they provide the diffusion coefficient, the erosion constant, the, the size of the capsule. And what I did is essentially I picked different values of our uh, cr crossover erosion constant close to the, the kappa. And as you can see, for a range of gamma, our values are the lines, may fall in the experimental range. And this just gives us an idea that this particular experimental set was prepared close to the crossover range. And uh, another uh, uh, feature that gives us this idea was that the release of the stem was exponential, confirm our, our predictions. So uh, in this way, I would like to conclude. Uh, we have uh, proposed a minimal model for investigate uh, this interplay between membrane erosion dynamics and the diffusion, drug diffusion. We found that at the crossover, we may have an exponential decay between those mechanisms. For values of B bigger than one, the erosion is the predominant mechanism controlling the drug release. And for B less than one, we have just a diffusion, a combined diffusion. We also provide some arguments that uh, provide us an analytical expression for tau that was adjusted, well adjusted for the Monte Carlo simulations, and we test this from uh, an experimental data as well. This work was published last, last year. Uh, we can find more there as well. Uh, I would like to thank my funding and also you for your attention, thank you very much. And I'll be happy if you have questions. Yeah, thank you, Marcia, for this very nice talk. Now I will have time for questions, please. So you consider that the erosion is linear in time, right? Yes. Uh, is this always the case or? No, no, it's a good question. Uh, that particular experimental research that I show, the erosion for that particular is linear. Is the reason our model may are in a good agreement with them. But usually it may depend on the type of materials that we are using, concentrations, maybe it's exponential. And uh, the, the next step maybe is to ch change the distribution of pores the dynamics, for example, to give an uh, exponential decay and see if these results change, for example. Thank you. Uh, Professor Bell. It's a very simple question I might have missed. How do you include erosion into your model? Could you yeah, show uh, this again? <laughs> yeah, of course, thank you. Uh, so, uh, essentially the idea was that uh, on each Monte Carlo step, I generate uh, an X variable uniform distributed between 0 and 1. And if this number is less than the probability that I'm assigning, that a pore will be formed, then a pore is removed for a, a random place on, over the membrane. It's, uh, very simply, this, in this way, you have that the, uh, the, the decay is essentially linear. But you should change the distribution to have, for example, an exponential, if you have a Poisson distribution, something like that. Thank you. I have a question. Man. You have used it molecular. Uh, MC for for your simulation, but you you can find in the literature several applications of molecular dynamics for real pouring intrusion, etc. Have you have you checked how to cope your approach to that results? Uh, not yet. Uh, as far as I know, from the molecular dynamics, we have uh, the system uh, that the number of particles is conserved. And here you are interesting. Uh, not really. You can. Yeah, you can have not conserved, but 
as far as here, it's yeah. more easy to do in Monte Carlo simulation. But this would be very nice if you have Monte Carlo okay. molecular dynamics for sure. sure. More questions? If not, let's thank Marcio again. Thank you very much, thank Marcio. You. Now I move to the next speaker, Leila Separdar. Yeah, she's coming. I'm not making any mistake. She's already saying thanks. <laughs> okay, thanks. This point? Okay, thank you. The point. Thank you. It's the last. Yes. Okay, Leila will talk about crystal group connects in super cool BAS semiconductor. Leila, please. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would uh, like to thank the organizing committee and all of you for your presence. Um, my talk is about crystal uh, growth kinetic in super cool barium sulfide semiconductor. Uh, the outline of my talk is um, uh, as follows. First of all, I will uh, start with a brief introduction about uh, crystallization, and uh, I will uh, uh, briefly uh, review three main models to describe uh, three main uh, theories to describe the growth kinetics in uh, materials. And then I will show you how to use um, seeding method uh, to uh, find the velocity, um, uh, the growth velocity. And uh, then um, uh, we, uh, I will talk about how these uh, theories are able to uh, describe our MD result molecular dynamic uh, driving growth rates or not. All of us are familiar with uh, melting and uh, freezing uh, points uh, of uh, materials. And uh, we know for some materials, these two points are not equal to each other. And uh, if uh, we look at the... And if uh, we plot the proper one property as a function of temperature, for example, potential energy, as a function of temperature, then we can see a hysteresis uh, uh, in this uh, plot. And uh, in this plot, when we hit the crystal at melting point, it enters to the liquid state. But uh, if we uh, cool down the liquid, it doesn't go back to the crystalline state, but enters to a metastable state that is called the supercooling state. The final uh, destination of this uh, metastable state is crystallization or vitrific uh, vitrification, which totally depends on its uh, cooling rate. If uh, we uh, cool the liquid um, quickly, it, uh, it uh, forms a glass. But if uh, we, uh, we cool down it um, slowly, uh, as, a as a result of thermal fluctuation, some uh, critical nuclei uh, can uh, form inside the supercooled liquid and leads the liquid toward uh, crystallization. So the uh, nucleation and growth are two main steps of any crystallization. And the um, knowledge about uh, the, uh, the, and the knowledge about the crystallization mechanism uh, can uh, help us to uh, develop strategies uh, to control the microstructures in the materials and uh, also to, uh, that uh, affects their uh, properties of materials. In the kinetic theory of uh, crystal growth, uh, the, uh, in the kinetic um, theory of crystal growth, the uh, growth rate is defined as a rate of uh, 
molecular uh, or atomic addition or subtraction to a crystalline seed, and uh, this velocity is, uh, can be uh, written as a multiple of two terms, the thermodynamic term and kinetic term. The thermodynamic uh, term uh, uh, at uh, low temperatures goes to unity, and the uh, kinetic term becomes more important, and it's a leading term in uh, crystallization, but uh, we don't know the exact um, um, uh, nature of this uh, kinetic term, and uh, based on the uh, different defini uh, definition that people uh, gives us, um, uh, there are three main models. Uh, one of them is diffusion control crystal growth, which was proposed by Wilson and Frankel. Uh, Frankel. And the other is collision control crystal growth, and the third one is phase field theory. In the diffusion control uh, crystal growth, uh, the velocity and the kinetic term is related to diffusion coefficient of particles, and uh, in this um, in this equation, the uh, lambda is jump distance, uh, L is lati crystal lattice spacing, F is a fraction of uh, preferred uh, growth sites, and uh, C is a unitless factor, which is determined from fitting. And uh, if, if um, uh, in the continuous or normal growth mode, F is equal to 1, but in a screw dislocation mode, uh, F is lower than 1 and uh, is related to uh, temperature. And this model was, uh, success, has some uh, successes and failures. Uh, for example, this model uh, was able to describe the experimental crystal growth and also the result of computer simulations in uh, some pure elements, alloys, or molecular liquids in temperature range between melting and glass transition temperature. But it uh, wasn't able to describe the rapid growth uh, rates in pure materials. Uh, so, um, uh, Bruy uh, Bruy Bruyton, Gilmer, Jackson uh, proposed another theory, uh, the collision control theory. In this theory, they relate the kinetic term to the temperature, to the uh, thermal velocity of particles. In this uh, theory, there is no energy barrier for the motion of an uh, atom across the liquid crystal interface. There is no need to uh, local structure of the liquid for uh, crystallization. And uh, this theory, it was able to uh, describe the uh, rapid uh, crystal growth in pure material, but uh, was, not, was a fate to, uh, for multi-component alloys uh, and uh, overestimate the growth rates in these uh, materials. The, kin in, uh, the kinetic phase, uh, phase field uh, theory is the thir uh, third one. In this uh, theory, the um, crystal lattice, um, the crystal and liquid interface uh, is uh, treated as a region uh, of final uh, width, and during this uh, width, um, If uh, we suppose here we have a crystal and here liquid, the interface between the liquid and crystal is treated as a, has a, a final width. And uh, some properties, for example, density changes when we go from a liquid part to the crystalline uh, part. In the traditional phase fit model, uh, the time evolution of uh, this uh, parameter, for example, density, which is called the order, order parameter, uh, was ignored. And this uh, theory, the radiational phase fit model, was only able to describe the uh, result of uh, velocity near to melting temperature. And recently, a group in the Germany, uh, in the uh, Germany, developed, reformulated these uh, phase field uh, equations, and uh, they uh, also uh, take into account the time evolution of all the parameters, and they show that this uh, new reformulated phase field uh, equation uh, were able to describe the growth velocity in these three uh, material in a wide temperature uh, range. But it again uh, was uh, 
uh, was failed to describe uh, the growth velocity in uh, silicon. So uh, which theory described best the uh, crystallization uh, in the materials uh, uh, still um, uh, we don't know exactly which one uh, can describe the uh, growth velocity, and to do um, and uh, for a better understanding, we try to simulate um, uh, one model material. Here we use the uh, barium sulfide for simulation. Bec uh, why we choose the barium sulfide? Because uh, there is a reliable potential for barium sulfide that uh, it, it was developed in our guru by uh, my supervisor, Professor Hino. And uh, also this material shows a spontaneous nucleation as, uh, at a deep supercooling and also has a, uh, has a in the melting curve, uh, it shows a large hysteresis. So let's uh, uh, make this opportunity for us to use the seeding method to uh, find the velocities. And uh, in the seeding method, uh, at a, uh, at temperature near to melting temperature, where the spontaneous uh, nucleation occurs very hardly uh, because we need a very big uh, critical uh, nuclei, uh, we insert uh, seeds uh, with a specific uh, radius, and uh, in this way we prompt the crystallization. And um, at deep supercooling here, uh, this barium sulfide shows the spontaneous nucleation. Uh, we uh, use uh, we inserted uh, four seed sizes, and then we let the, uh, this, uh, and then we found the temperature at which this seed uh, start to uh, grow, and then uh, we let the seed to grow, uh, and uh, the system uh, crystallized totally. Um, the, after that, by counting the number of solid like liquid and then using the, uh, this relation, we found the time evolution of the radius of the seed. Uh, uh, and the, a linear fit to this uh, uh, time uh, region uh, gives us the velocity of the um, uh, gr uh, crystal growth. Uh, we uh, found the velocity for these uh, four uh, seeds, and uh, from, for a spontaneous nucleation, we didn't need any uh, seed for inserting the uh, simulation box. Uh, here, uh, we uh, plotted the, all the data we have obtained from simulation. Uh, the black circle is related to seeding method. The green circle is related to the um, spontaneous nucleation. And blue and uh, red uh, points uh, related to uh, growing the seed at temperature lower than their uh, onsen temperature. Uh, we will use the blue and the red um, points uh, for uh, validating the theoretical fitting. Uh, and uh, uh, first of all, we uh, test the collision control growth uh, theories. This theory was not able to describe the, all the data points and doesn't pass from the all the data point. Uh, then we uh, uh, try to fit the uh, data with a kinetic phase field theory. Also, this theory passed uh, through the uh, black and green data points. But uh, after we added the uh, blue and uh, red uh, circles, uh, we saw that the fit line doesn't pass through these uh, data points. So this theory was not able also to uh, capture all the features of the uh, velocity under cooling curve. And uh, then we tested the diffusion control, gross kinetic with normal and uh, screw dislocation mode. And we uh, found that this um, diffusion control crystal gross kinetic with uh, screw dislocation growth uh, very well described the uh, data, described the growth rates. And also, when uh, we uh, extrapolate to high temperature, this model also captured the melting point that uh, we have obtained from two-phase coexistent method. And uh, finally, uh, let me not review all of them. <laughs> then, um, 
Uh, finally, we found that uh, in the barium sulfide, uh, what uh, controls the crystal growth is the diffusion of particles. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. <laughs> we have time for a few questions. Yes, uh, I have a quick question, a basic question about the series. In the beginning, we were talking. One of them, you had this two different modes, one which was a normal mode and the other which was a Scrooge's location it's mode. I, I suppose the crystal is, is growing it's around its Scrooge's location or something like that. You don't have these features in the other series or...? or, or the, I don't have any. These features, mm -hmm. these the picture of different is modes, for instance, for the other series? Uh, yes, uh, we, uh, for... Uh, Collision control also. Let me show you here. Uh, in the case of collision control growth theory, we also use both of them, uh, the normal mode and screw dislocation mode. Uh, but I didn't have much time to... <laughs> no, no, that's <laughs> yes. fine. That's just a and, clarification uh, about And we uh, use a different set of uh, data points for uh, fitting, and we try to fit this data, MD data, but uh, this model was not able uh, to describe none of them, normal or screw dislocation. No, no, no. Thank you. More questions? Okay. Well, thank you for the talk. And I mean, how, how you perform your simulations? I mean, you, you use like how you control the temperature of, your, of your, um, your simulations? For simulation, we have used the LAMPS package, and uh, we use the NVT ensemble, and uh, in this way, we control the temperature. OK. More questions? If not, let's thank Leila again. Thank you very much, Leila. Thank you. Thank you. Now I go to the next talk, Anna Dovais Diaz. Dovais Diaz. Anna? Yes. Okay, Anna, we'll, we'll talk about me and Fion theory for a vixed like model on a lattice. Anna, please. Good morning. So, yes, I'll talk about some new field theory for a vixed like model on a lattice. That's a uh, work that I'm developing with Professor Ronald Dickman at Universidade Federal of Minas Gerais. So, I will start talking briefly about what active matter is and some review of the VSEC model. Then I'll present my model and some results that I get so far. So first, at matter, we define it as a group of uh, individuals that self-propel within the environment. And the main characteristic is that the emergence of, uh, of collective motion without the presence of a leader. So some examples we have here the school of fish or flock of birds. And as we we seen yesterday, uh, non-biological non uh, cases also applies to active matter, as this, this is the case of some robots. So the VSEC model uh, follows a simple rule where a particle will align with the uh, mean orientation inside this neighborhood uh, that's defined here with is the circle of the radius R. And this alignment isn't uh, perfect because of the presence of some noise. S and after the alignment, we have the movement in following its new direction. So uh, for each time, each uh, step of time, the particle 
we will all the particles in the system will have this position and orientation updated. So the position uh, is updated following its new direction. And for orientation, we have the sum uh, here that gives the mean orientation of the particles inside the, the neighborhood and uh, ag some additive noise with strength at that will disturb this alignment. So we want to see the emergence of some collective motion, so we talk about ordering. So the other parameter is defined here as the average uh, velocity, directional velocity of the particles. And so when, if ve these velocities are random distributed, we have uh, the other parameters equal zero. If some, some, dominant, some, some velocity starts to dominate, it's different from zero. So the system behavior is controlled by the noise, the density, and the velocity of our particles. Uh, to study how it evolves in time, we kept uh, the density and the velocity fixed, and the, the noise will change. So the system is initially in a disordered stage, so when they distributed the velocities. And what happens is uh, that for high noise, we have a disordered, we keep it, uh, the system is disordered, the particles can align. As we decrease the, the noise, uh, we have this transition for some other bands, so some groups start to follow the same, same, the, in the same direction. And increasing even more the noise, we reach the order uh, on some homogeneous order, where the, uh, basically all the particles in the system start to follow some wind of direction. So here's the other parameter, is a function of noise. Uh, so we have here the, the other parameter, it's almost equal, it's 0.8 when the, the noise is small, and it goes to zero when we increase the, the noise. So some important features that we can take from that is the interaction range. So we usually consider that there is some alignment uh, interaction between the, between the particles inside the system, and we need to define uh, its neighbors so we can define the, the range of the interaction. And we consider the noise, so some noise that will disturb this, this interaction, and also the space is important because uh, for a VSEC model, we have a continuous space, so directions, uh, all directions is possible, but you can have some discrete space where the velocities uh, will be discrete, discretized too, and also we have a minimum distance between particles. And the, in this discrete space that I work with, so I have a triangular let's with n self-propelled particles that can only have three orientations, so this velocity v1, v2, and v3. Uh, they have the same magnitude, so uh, the position uh, of a particle in the lattice and its velocity defines the, its state. So in the sense, we say that we have n i particles in state i, where i goes to 1, to 3, and refers to the, the, the orientation of the velocity. And we define the fraction of particles. That's the, the quantity that we, we need to analyze because we give it the information about the order in the system. Uh, so n is kept fixed, and i will, will vary with time, and we always have to obey these restrictions that the sum of fractions is equal to 1. So the alignment interaction in, in the system uh, allows a particle to change its direction to align with the velocity that is the majority inside this neighborhood, and the noise is implemented as the probability that the, this particle will perceive incorrectly which is the velocity of the majority. And we also added some uh, excluded volume condition, so the particles can be at the same site at the same time. So my neighborhood is defined, uh, is restricted to the, six, to the first six neighbors of a particle, so is this, plus itself. So each of the site has a probability ho of being occupied, and if occupied, the site has a probability probability FI of being one of these three states. So this mean, of, this mean field approximation, uh, we consider the, the probability of occupation of each of the sites is independent of each other. So we have for each neighborhood, 
uh, four po possible events. So the majority of particles velocity v1, v2, or v3. And we factorize the probabilities of each site to calculate the probability of a particle that is in state i, being a neighborhood where event mj occurs to determine, determine if it will align in which direction. So the dynamics of the system is that follows here. So we have here a particle in state 2 in a neighborhood with majority 1. So if the alignment occurs, so now we have here uh, the particle velocity v1, and it can change, can move to the, the site, to the neighbor site here, that is in the direction of this new, new velocity. And when it, it moves, we have now a new uh, neighborhood, and this process occurs all over again. In, in this is made at the same time for other particles inside my, my lights. So uh, for the alignment step, we have what we call the equations of motion. So it's the variation of the fractions of particle in time. The first term here account for the losses uh, of particles due to alignment and noise. And the other two terms are accounts for the gain because of the same factors. The movement step uh, is modeled as a transfer density. So we have a site n with density s0, and its neighbor, a site n plus 1, with density r0. So the neighbor can receive uh, from, from the site s a quantity of density that is, is equal 1 minus r due to the school development condition. So we have two cases. First, uh, if the amount of, of, dens of density that the site n can transfer, transfer is different for the amount that its neighbor can receive, we follow this equation 7, or the case where the n plus 1 can receive all the density from this neighbor. So we, have, we follow this equation 8. So uh, my results initially uh, consider only the alignment step. So my initial conditions is the homogeneous lattice. We have periodic boundary conditions. So we define some density, rho, that is kept fixed, and we will vary various uh, eta. And we define here for initial conditions for the fractions that F1 is bigger, is bigger than F2 and F3 for the amount of delta, while F2 and F3 are set to be equal. So we solve the equation of motion of the three of them until we reach the uh, stationary stage. So what's happened uh, it's here, so that's the time evolution of the system for a density of 0 0.7 and delta equal 10 to the power of minus 2. So that's the general uh, behavior. So for low noise, we have the F1 gets really bigger than F. So we say the velocity 1 is majority. And we call this the other state. As I, as I start to decrease, increase at, there's two cases here, uh, I still have the velocity 1 as a majority, but the difference uh, between the fractions here starts to diminish. And eventually, I reach some critical noise, where the, from this point on, I have the, the final state where all the fractions are, uh, are equal, so we call one third. And that's what I call the disorder state. So, other we have a other uh, disorder transition that occurs at some critical noise, and it's a, dense, uh, a function of density. So this transition uh, is discontinuous, and the other parameter uh, is the the finest follower here because uh, since I have this uh, f1 equal f2 equal f3 in the disorder phase, so when I have this one, to, all equal one third, I, I have zero here, and if some some fraction it's bigger than the others. I have different, uh, all the parameters different from zero. So that's the phase diagram. So as I increase my density, I have also to increase the, the noise to reach the disorder phase. And that's the other parameter as a function of noise for some values of density. And we have here the degree of order uh, decreasing until we have a abrupt jump to zero. So, uh, 
Now I start with the movement, and now I have to consider the, the size of the lats, and I have a spatial dependence. So first, uh, I we start to investigate the per persistence of bands. So here I have a static band in the direction of velocity 1, and I have two cases, uh, so F1 equal 1, or F1 equal one third plus 10 to the power of minus, minus 10, and outside we have a dissolved state with low density. So it evolves, and the band uh, maintains, and actually F1 is bigger here, and I have here uh, some regions with velocity 2 in green and velocity 3 in blue. So in the final stage for this case, uh, with this noise and density, is a coexistence phase. And things got more interesting when I increase the density, so for density 0.5, when I have this, this delta contained to the power of minus 2, I have this situation where the majority are divided between fraction velocities 2 and 3, and I form what we call so a uh, traffic jam. So he in blue, in, in green, is the velocity two trying to go up, and in blue, the velocity two trying to go down. And the, in this state is actually uh, stable. So finally, uh, another thing that we tried was initial configuration, where all the parts were in a disordered state, but vary here uh, the density in the direction of each velocity. So here for v1, v2, and v3, and this clear areas here uh, has a density bigger than the rest of the lattice. So first we have, start, we have this cluster formation, and at this point we, don't, we can't identify which was the initial configuration, but eventually we reach this final state where the velocity that dominates is the velocity that the, the initial variation was directed at. So we have some bands, also some bands here in the direction of this velocity. So to conclude, we have a discontinuous order to order phase transition in the alignment step. And when we let the movement occur, we observe the emergence of this collective behaviors. Uh, there's characters of earth matter. So you see the persistence of bands and also the emergence of some traffic genes. And finally, some small perturbation in the density uh, leads to the formation of, of some patterns and the emergence of bands as well. So, thank you. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> we have time for one or two questions. Yes. So, in principle, VicSec models can be generalized to anti-alignment uh, interactions, right? So, instead of aligning, you can anti-align with the same uh, energy, so with the same probability, like self-propelled roads, bacteria. In your case, you cannot have anti-alignment exactly because you have three directions. Yes, it's for simplicity. I yeah. could put other velocities. It can be done, but for simplicity, we just just this three. So in principle, in your case, to introduce something like anti-alignment, you would have to have like equal probabilities for the other two directions. It could be interesting to see uh, if this still has the same properties of uh, actual anti-alignment uh, situations in four directions or infinite number of directions. Yes. More questions? I have a question. Uh, this very nice model, do you have any example of a real system where you can apply this? No, <laughs> I can't think in, in any. Think about it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> now I move to the next speaker, Igor Morai Talis.
Okay, Igor will talk about effects of electrolyte coupling and surface polarization on the polar electrolyte brush structure. Igor, please. So, okay. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Igor. I am a PhD student at the uh, Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Sul, where, where I have the privilege of working, be, working under the supervision, supervision of uh, Professor Alexandre dos Santos. And today I will be uh, discussing some of the results of this, of one of the or less latest works. So here uh, we, we try to study the behavior of spherical polar electrolyte brushes using uh, molecular dynamics uh, simulations to investigate how the uh, surface polarization and electrostatic coupling can uh, affect the brush properties, like the, um, uh, the, brush, the size brush and also the counter ion distribution around the, this structure. So what is this structure, right? Um, we, I, he, here I have a, a schematic illustration of this uh, structure. Here we, ha we have a spherical nanocore where there are some uh, charged polymer chains etched to these um, nanocore, nanocores, and we have some counter ions from these uh, charged polymer chains. So, uh, we model this system uh, by this. We consider a nanoparticle with radius A and dielectric constants epsilon C. Uh, 14, um, 14 polymer chains, polyelectrolyte chains are added to this uh, inorganic surface. And all the system is uh, confined inside a spherical, spherical cell of radius R. And, uh, and we have a a dielectric, dielectric constant of the surrounding medium equals to the epsilon w. Uh, here I have some more information of, uh, about the, our model. We have NN monomers with uh, positive charge, and we have NC uh, counter ions uh, given by the number of polyelectrolyte chains times the number of, of monomers. And uh, also, all the ionic particles are have a radio, ionic radius equals to two hang, angstroms. And then we can um, define a length scale of the simulations. Uh, actually, you use uh, the diameter of this, uh, of our, uh, the diameter of the ions as our, our nature scale of our simulations. And with that, we can uh, define an electrostatic coupling, which depends on the valence of the ions and the behavioral length, which is given by this equation here, where Q is the elementary proton, elementary charge. Uh, KB, KB is the Boltzmann uh, constant, and T is the temperature. Uh, here are some uh, details of the simulations. We perform um, Langevin dynamic simulations. Uh, to model the polyelectrolyte chains, we use the harmonic potation. Uh, the Leonard Jones potential is to avoid some overlaps between the ionic particles. And then for the electrostatic interactions, we rely on the, um, on the method of image charts. So when we have a conducting nanocore, we consider this expression here, which means that we, we epsilon c is going to infinity. And when we have the, a dielectric nanocore, we consider this equation here which uh, epsilon c is much less than e epsilon w. Uh, and gamma here is the dielectric dial dial construct between the medium and the nanocore. And here are some of the results, OK? Uh, we have the results for small and big nanocores. I will talk about what is small and big for, uh, uh, very next. Uh, in both cases, we have 14. Um, 14 polyelectrolyte chains, um, the, and we obtain, for the, we obtain a result for gamma equals minus 1, 0, and 0 0.95, where minus 1 is the case for a metallic or conduct, conducting nanocore, 0 is for an unpolarizable case, and um, gamma equals 0 0.95 is the dielectric case. And we... Um, go from uh, 1 to 100 the, from the electrostatic company. Uh, this electrostatic electrostatic 
decoupling can be related with the uh, many ratio by this uh, equation here, six. So when we have uh, electrostatic coupling equals one, it's, it's equivalent of we have a many ratio of 0 0.67 and so on for like say, uh, Kc equals 100, we have six, uh, six seven here. So uh, small number chords, what, what is this? It's when we consider our radius equals 40 angstrom and uh, Nm equals 30. So we have a, um, a craft density equals to 0 0.07 chains per nanometer square. square. And here is the, uh, the, the radius of the spherical cell. So here, I have the uh, concentration for files. The top figures are the counterwind counter distribution, and the bottom figures are the um, monomers uh, distribution. Uh, here are for the results for, for 150 and 100 compare parameter. And this uh, black curve here is the uh, modified Poisson Boltzmann equation that we present in our, our work, and I will try try to talk about this if I had some time. So here we can see that uh, uh, for high electrostatic coupling, uh, more less counter ions are, ad are adsorbed on the nanocore surface. Also uh, goes for the same for the, uh, for the monomers. This is quite uh, uh, counterintuitive because uh, in charged colloids, as we increase the the electrostatic coupling more and more uh, cation ions adsorb on the um, on the nan nanocore surface or the, or the colloid uh, surface. So this uh, uh, as uh, makes some consequences in the brush size. So here we have the the brush size uh, which is given by this RB. So as we increase the the electrostatic, electrostatic coupling. We see a, a very interesting effect that we, we call it, that is a shrink swelling effect. So for high electrostatic coupling, the brush brush starts to swell instead instead of keep it uh, in a shrinking uh, effect. And then I can we have some uh, snapshots of the of the system to uh, see this more visually. Uh, and I want to point for this structure here, which is the dielectric case for the uh, Kc equals 50, where we see some very interesting uh, structures here, we, which are some tree-like structures that uh, we see um, uh, that the competition between the electrostatic ionic interaction, ionic attraction between the, the ions and the chains uh, form this structure here, and then there, there are competition with the ionic, uh, the image here portions between this uh, nanocore here. Um, and then we have the case of the big nanocore, where we consider a nanocore radius, radius equal to 260 um, 60, 60, uh, monomers, which is a very low uh, gra crafting density of the of the brush, and then I'll, we again again have the counter ion distribution here and the monomers distribution also for the again from the 150 and 100 coupling parameter, and here again is the modified Poisson Boltzmann equation, which is is just for the case of unpolarizable and weak uh, electrostatic coupling, and. Again, we see that uh, for high electrostatic coupling, uh, the brush is the, the, the counter ions and the monomers are less adsorbed on the, the surface of the, the nanocore. <coughs> this also re reflects in the shrink swelling effect, which is can be more, um, uh, which is more clear here for this uh, big nanocore case. We have a, 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 a big shrink swelling effect here, uh, even for the conduct case. And then here again, we have some snapshots of the equilibrium configuration. Again, we have these three like structures here, which is caused by the competition between the ionic at attraction and the repulsion from the um, from the image of the surface. And also this one, this one here for the conduct case. 
we can see that uh, the most of the of the of the ions are adsorb adsorbed on the surface of this uh, the surface of the of the nanocore, and then this makes the uh, polyelectrolyte chains uh, keeps non-neutralize non non it, and this non-neutralization uh, attracts the the polyelectrolyte chains to the to the to the nanocore to the nanocores, and then collapsing all the all the all the structure. And then some final remarks here uh, for small nanocores, uh, polyelectrolyte brushes or higher craft densities, uh, metallic and unpolarized nanocores are quite similar. While for the dialect case, we see that uh, uh, three like brushes, three like structures. Uh, the differences between metallic and unpolarized case results by the counter ion attraction to the surface, increase in the counter ion chain binding. Uh, and both cases, you see that uh, three like structures. And also for large uh, nanocores, we observe that the metallic case is more efficient to shrink the, the PEB, caused by the PEB is the polyelectrolyte brush, caused by the high counter ion absorption on the quartz co surface. And finally, for uh, higher electrolyte coupling, uh, we have more stretched, stretched uh, structures leading to the shrinking swelling effect. So I would like to thank you for your kind of attention. I also would like to acknowledge my supervisor, Alexandre Santos, and my colleague, Mohamed Arfa, uh, my funding institutions, and uh, the organizer of this nice event. Thank you all. Thank you very much. We have time for a few questions for Igor. Oh, yes. Maybe you said it, but can you give a simple, uh, intuitive reason for the re-swelling? So, so, sorry? Why, why is it re-swelling for large Coulomb couplings? Ah, what, is, what it is re-swelling because uh, when the, uh, there are, uh, this re-swelling uh, is caused by, in all the cases because when the, there are, the, the, the polyelectrolyte chains start to repo, repose uh, between them. And this repulsion between the, the, the polyelectrolyte chains keeps the strategy, strategy, and then the countermines bind these, uh, these polyelectrolyte chains, and then the polyelectrolyte chains are unable to uh, collapse on the surface. So basically, this stretched uh, structure is caused by the repulsion between the monomers, the charged monomers. And then this repulsion between the charged monomers mm -hmm. keeps the they stretch it and they are binded by the, the counter ions. And, and the counter ions are almost completely condensed on the, uh, on the almost chains. completely condensed. Yes, yes, yes exactly, okay. exactly. For and, this and case here. And, and uh, do you have salt? Solvent. Yeah, the, the salt. solvent. The solvent here is uh, co -ions. just co ions. Co ions. No, 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 no. We don't have salt here. Okay, but then it depends also sensitively on the container size. No? You have this spherical container. Yes, yes, yes. Since no, but uh, we, we have the, we also, uh, this container size is big enough to, to have some bulk. So at far from this, um, far from the, from the parallel electrolyte, we have, uh, we have a bulk. It, it's not uh, completely neutralized because uh, we don't have salt here. But most of the, the ions are around of the, of the polyelectrolyte. So there are just some few ions. Quite no, but but quite if you would make the container very, very large, entropy will suck away all the counter ions. That's, that's just the argument. Uh, we can discuss this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. <laughs> Thank you very much. More questions? I have a question. I mean, this type of system was heavily investigated in the literature for real systems using either X-rays or neutron scattering methods. And uh, it would be very interesting if your procedure can predict the, 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 the radio density profiles that they show in the real experimental work. Have you, have you tried that? Yes, we uh, actually no, no, not in this work, but, uh, but we are trying to improve the method to include uh, some metallicity, metallicity on this on these things because here is basically uh, perfectly conduct, uh, conducting uh, 
uh, services. So we're trying to modify the equations to give this, uh, I don't know, have gold particles, silver particles, titanium particles, and so on. Okay. Thank you very much. More questions? If not, let's thank him again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, as for last but not least, e speaker, my colleague Vera Enriquez. Please, Vera. Acho que sim. É... Eu sempre me atrapalho com o pointer de treinar. <risos> Aqui? So, Vera Aqui, will né? talk about. Wow, it's a long title. <risos> the associated li lipid <risos> bilayers, lattice models for equilibrium and transport properties, and the second layer also. So, please, Vera. <risos> So I would like to first thank the organizers for the invitation and for the opportunity to speak about this, um, this work. Uh, the second title is the title which I sent to the organizers, but uh, then I decided that it would, was very specific and very technical, so I decided to give a, a more general uh, talk. So this work was developed mainly with Wagner Gomez, who is in Federal do Amazonas, so I will give some motivation, speak of the, la the equilibrium model, always lattice uh, models, non-equilibrium model, and future work. Uh, to, as to motivation, uh, we are interested in the membrane, uh, the experimental model membrane, the very simple one, not asymmetric like Thais showed us, but uh, constituted of uh, a, single, a single type of lipid, and which displays this very nice, very sharp, um, oops, sorry, <laughs> a very sharp uh, transition in which uh, the lipid chains disorder with temperature, uh, seen here in the specific heat. Well, this problem has been studied quite thoroughly. Uh, a <coughs> Our interest is in this uh, situation in which the lipid head group dissociates, releasing here a uh, co-ion, and uh, as compared to lipid <coughs> uh, experimental model membranes, where the di dipolar head group, uh, di the head group is dipolar, uh, besides the sharp transition, we have this shoulder here which develops, and so our interest is in, in uh, understanding what's happening uh, in this region. <coughs> oh, sorry. So uh, there are, this has been, this system has been studied by very different techniques, ther uh, uh, thermodynamic, mechanics, transport properties, scattering, but here I will show you just uh, some of these um, uh, measurements. This work, uh, this is Thais' work, uh, where here we, the, the vesicle radius is measured through oops, dynamic light scattering, uh, and the radius of the vesicle is obtained from Stokes-Einstein. Uh, so admitting that, the sphere, that you have spheres, then you can extract the radius. However, if you do static light scattering, uh, <coughs> the result is very different. Let me go back here. You can see that there is a small increase. Here, I, I, I'm showing this shoulder region in the specific heat, which I call transition uh, uh, anomalous region. You see a small increase here in the radius. However, if under static light scattering, uh, there is a huge increase, apparently a huge increase in radius in this region. And in this case, 
of static light scattering, uh, <coughs> you obtain radius from a set of experiments directly from the Zim plots. You, you do it for different angles and different concentrations and extract here the radius. So the, the question is posed, wh why such different results between the two uh, measurements? So here <coughs> we show that for neutral lipids, for those lipids which uh, behave well upon the transition, uh, DLS and SLS data coincide, sorry, <laughs> oops, um, coincide. Whereas for charged vesicles, uh, these are the DLS data and these are the SLS data. Uh, so the hypothesis, one of the hypotheses raised is that um, the, the vesicle becomes porous in that um, anomalous region. And be, be, if it becomes very porous but does not um, uh, change as, as, a, as, as a system, uh, the radius must increase. Uh, and on the other side, other measurements, because the, the lipids are dissociating, are on uh, electro electric properties. One of them is shown here. The conductivity of the system increases, uh, may be indicating that dissociation increases uh, in, in this temperature range. <coughs> So we had um, looked at models for uh, these, this transition. This transition, there is a, 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 use, a very useful model from the 80s by Doniak, which just um, sort of an easy, easy model, easy model, <laughs> um, <coughs> two state. And what we did, so here we have stretched, stretched chains and uh, disordered chains. Uh, Donex model, we just have two, two states. We want to look at pores, so we included a, an empty state. And um, in, in, in the first study, we <coughs> showed that these pores are uh, always uh, mainly surrounded by uh, lipids in the dis with disordered chains. Then we want to introduce charge, <coughs> so we had to add a third dimension here to the to the lipid um, leaflet. And here we have so dissociating head groups, uh, and we had to add this to in order to to allow for the co-ions or counter ions to, to be there and associate or dissociate. Um, <coughs> what uh, we were able to see was that, uh, oh, here I, I, it's wrong, it's chain disorder. <laughs> as a chain is disorder, as a chain's disorder, I have not said this, but uh, as the chain's disorder, uh, the head groups must go apart. <laughs> So if they're near here, if they disorder by <coughs> excluded volume, they must go apart. And so it is natural that you, you may have them, they're further away, they may be, uh, they may um, dissociate more easily. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we looked also at the pores and what happens if you compare <coughs> the neutral membrane with the dissociating membrane, the pore distribution changes and you have larger pores in the dis dissociating bilayers. Um, well, um, <coughs> because the, uh, our interest was in, in, in uh, understanding this difference between the uh, DLS and SLS measurements, uh, we decided to look at transport properties. And so we must look at uh, Boltzmann's equation for the 
distribution of particle velocities. And we did this uh, also on the lattice using the lattice Boltzmann uh, method in which you discretize sp space. <coughs> Sorry, I think I'll go back here. So what we want to see is the F is the distribution of particles which depends on uh, position and velocity. And we want this uh, distribution to uh, evolve in time. So you have a diffusion and a collision part, which in, under the uh, very simple, the simplest assumption, uh, behaves as uh, relaxes to the Maxwell uh, distribution with a certain collision frequency or certain time rate. So on the lattice, you can do this discretizing space, of course, but also discretizing velocities. And <coughs> then you have here um, uh, a set of um, nine velocities. <laughs> Possible in this model, there are different models. And uh, you have the distribution of velocities in each direction. And after the collision, this set of velocity, the set of pr uh, distribution probabilities evolves to a new distribution and then propagates to the next cell. So here, this distribution will propagate in all these directions. <coughs> We had, uh, well, that, that is, is um, with respect to transport. Um, with respect to charge, uh, <coughs> we, you, we have to include an electrostatic potential. And in this case, we um, use um, a fast multiple Monte Carlo uh, and in which you do direct calcul Coulomb calculations for the nearer particles and multiple expansion for the further particles. Uh, and very quickly, <coughs> we get, one of the things we get is that we can, we're able to calculate the drag ratio uh, for porous uh, particles. So the drag ratio depends on permeability. It is one if permeability is zero, so we, we cover the stokes einstein relation. But as permeability increases, the drag ratio goes down. And since the drag coefficient is uh, <coughs> also related to diffusion, the diffusion constant, what we have is if the diffusion constant is, is some value, if CD goes down, this means that the uh, radius must go up. So this could explain uh, the difference between, so um, <coughs> diffusion would be the same because of porosity, but uh, the drag coefficient would be different. A second result very quickly <laughs> for on charge, the lattice Boltzmann plus the, the fast multiple method allowed us to calculate mobility. And here the situation is also interesting to look at. Uh, uh, the mobility is not, it increases with char effective charge initially, but then it um, stabilizes at some, at some point here. So the role of charge is not um, clear yet. Future investigations, so we want to compare this to uh, the experimental data, experimental investigation of pores, uh, look at the concentration of charge, where does it, do they stay, and these correlations. So, thank you. Thank ah, you very much. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> All the guys, yes. This is our theoretical group, as you can see. Uh, Wagner is in Amazonas, here on the Amazon River, Pará. <laughs> uh, Eduardo is at, at the south. We're spreading so we are out the world. Spread yeah. out <laughs> and in time and in space. Fantastic. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for questions, please. Yes, Danilo. I, I have a, a question about the poros. 
Uh, are they movable? Can they merge or, or, or split or do, do stuff like that? Or, or are they we fixed sequentially? We did know. We did not look at the dynamics, but they relaxed with the equilibrium. Uh, we look at the equilibrium distribution. So uh, I did not. We did not look at the dynamics. So they must do this during the simulation. More questions? I have a comment. Very nice that you are trying to. Describe experimental data, so <laughs> brave. <laughs> so, other questions? If not, let's thank Vera and all the other guys. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, now it's lunchtime and we'll be back at 2 p.m. <laughs>